So check out what I just found. A little brown snake. It's a windy day today. So how you guys doing? I'm Chris Ignato and I've decided to go for a walk and bring you with me. You know, all the parks are closed except for this one. Let's see what there is to find and come along. Of course, like all my videos, I do not recommend you go out there and copy what I'm doing. I'm not telling you to go eat wild plants or to even use them as medicine. If you want to do that, you better cross-reference with a lot of materials and team up with a professional. You make a mistake with this stuff and you can end up dead. This little plant is called cleavers or bed straw. Pretty easy to identify and when young, it's pretty tasty. Kind of like a mild lettuce with a hint of a straw-like aroma. Another great addition to my salads. Settlers used to make mattresses out of this plant because it can grow rather prolifically. Once mature, it tends to get a fibrous texture, which might be good for making those mattresses. It's not the best thing for food. A cool thing about the bed straw is that it has a square stem. Even blindfolded, you can easily pick it out by rolling the stem between your fingers. This little herb is called Spring Beauty. I find this plant to be so delicious, I have a dedicated video all about it. Every part of the plant is great. The stem, the leaves, taste like fresh spring lettuce. Absolutely amazing when I throw them in my salads or even eat them as is. The tap roots are like little potatoes and in my opinion, you simmer them in some water and they taste like a cross between chestnuts and a red potato. Throw some butter on there and I'm in heaven. This is wintercress, also known as scurvy grass. This plant can be available as early as February. The young leaves are pretty tasty. They're kind of like a garlicky lettuce. I often harvest a lot of them and throw them in a large Ziploc bag filled with some air and throw it in the fridge. They last for weeks. Bittercress also gets the name scurvy grass because it's high in both vitamins A and C. I usually throw the leaves and the flower heads into my salads, but it can also be cooked as a pot herb similar to spinach. Just boil it up, throw some salt and pepper and butter on it, and you're good to go. Lesser salandine is considered an invasive plant because it's not native and it grows in abundance. In fact, when it rains, the water washes all the, the little bulbs down the hillsides and anywhere in floodways, and this plant is just prolific. As I said, people often mistake it for buttercups, but it's not buttercup. This is stinging nettle, and it's actually a pretty nutritious plant. It's really high in iron and even has good amounts of protein, especially towards the tips of some of the older plants. It happens to be an antispasmatic, anti-inflammatory, a diuretic, it's a wonderful tonic. It's even great for treating things like arthritis. When steamed up or boiled, it tastes like really sweet spinach. I love it. Nettle is covered with urticating hairs. The hairs on nettle can be really potent. Just the slightest touch and the silica tips will break off and you'll be injected with a venom-like compound. That compound is made up of acetylcholine, serotonin, and histamines. And believe me, it can really burn and itch. Northern redback salamander, ground beetles, 
worms, little snail, little family of As you can see, the northern redbacks, the lead face and the redback face, are just abundant pretty much all year, but especially in the spring, summer, and fall, underneath almost any log or rock that I find. This is a fun patch. We've got some Virginia bluebell, Dutchman's bridges, which I'll show you in a minute. We've even got some tooth wart right here, which is an awesome plant. It's kind of peppery tasting. We got lots of trout lily and uh, even some bloodroot. Bloodroot's an amazing little plant. I love these leaves. They're all a little different. And then the flowers themselves are pretty impressive. Okay, here's a blood root that I accidentally stepped on, but it'll give you an example of why it's called blood root. Often that'll be a deep red, looks a lot like blood. Later in the year, in the summer, that'll look like blood. Okay, so it's a little early in the year, but I'm still collecting some yarrow because it has a ton of medicinal properties. People use it to treat, you know, the common cold, fevers, dysentery, other GI issues like diarrhea and stuff. Um, they actually treat it, use it to treat hay fever. It's a great blood tonic. You know, it's a good infection fighter. It helps stop bleeding. People even use it for menstruation issues. So this is a great plant. It doesn't taste the best, but I love to chew on it makes my tongue a little bit numb and tingly or something but I really like yarrow and it's a great thing to have in my medicine cabinet so back to what I'm doing so check out what I just found I thought it was a, a leopard slug at first for well because it was brownish with black spots but it turns out I took a second look and it's a, a northern brown snake it's all curled up right now to protect its head the most vulnerable point and also because it's a little bit cold out for a snake these snakes and northern garter snakes are pretty much the first snakes I'll see in early spring, sometimes even the end of winter when there's still little patches of snow on the ground. I'll still find garter snakes and sometimes northern browns. Brown snakes like to eat sometimes baby salamanders, but more often they'll feed on soft-bodied insects such as crickets, and they really like earthworms. I've seen these to feed more on earthworms than pretty much anything else. You might see the snake sticking its tongue out. It does that to sense its environment. That's actually how they smell. Their tongues are very sensitive and they give them a whole bunch of information on the landscape. They also let them know if it's perhaps potential food source and in some cases if it's a predator or not. So when you see a snake sticking its tongue out, it's not trying to look mean or aggressive. The tongue can't harm you. It's just trying to get more information. Kind of like the antennas in the snake world. They don't get very long. I don't usually see these any more than, say, 18 or 22 inches. They're often around this size. Please excuse the, the blood root stains on my hand. It's got nothing to do with the snake. It's from the plant. So let's turn the snake loose. I like to put them beside the log after I return the log so I don't squish the snake or animal. I just put the log back and then I set the creature next to it and it could go under the log on its own accord without getting hurt. Thanks a lot little snake. I love these guys. Thanks a lot for watching. Be sure to check out this video over here that YouTube has selected specifically for you based on your watch time. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button, but you gotta click the bell icon because if you don't, YouTube will never let you know when a new video of mine comes out.